Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Turn in your Bibles to a new book, to the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 1. We finished out 2 Corinthians last week. We're now in 1 Kings uh, this week. Uh, Before we pray and and get into the Word, uh, it could be that you've come and you've just heard me say, turn in your Bible to 1 Kings, and you go, 1 Kings? What, what is it? I don't even know what that is. Um, oh, that's somewhere in the Old Testament? Uh, I, I didn't sign up. I didn't know I was coming to that. I don't know if I can handle that. And it could be, I understand, that in, in our Bible study uh, could be too much. Um, I understand that Christianettes like sermonettes. Uh, but this is a different group. This is a group of hungry people who are interested in Scripture And I'm supposing you're one of them as well. Uh, Even if you have come and you don't know about 1 Kings, hopefully uh, it will pique your interest. Uh, If it hasn't, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. I'm going to bow my head, you're going to bow your head. And if you during that time think, yeah, I don't know if I can sit through an hour Bible study, please make that decision before we start not after we start in the middle of uh, the message where you say, okay, I'm out of here. Then all the eyes turn and focus on you leaving and you become a distraction from what God is trying to teach people in the word. I'm sure you wouldn't want that. I know I wouldn't. So um, let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we do thank you that this book is not just another book. It is your book. It is your word. It is God-breathed. And as Paul said to Timothy, all Scripture is profitable for our instruction, for our admonition. And so, Father, as it is God-breathed and as it gives us lessons that we can't get anywhere else, it centers us, it comforts us, it challenges us, it shows us how life ought to be lived by its principles. We pray that your Holy Spirit would superintend the teaching of your word as we study it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you again why I love Wednesday nights and why I love this group. I was reading an article this week uh, by Lifeway Research that said that Americans love the Bible said, most Americans love the Bible, but they don't actually read it. Which I found to be an interesting, ironic statement. That is, they say they love the Bible, the Bible is important, they would assert, but they just never get around to actually reading it. And the article said, 82% of Americans who say they are Christians have never once read through the whole Bible. 80 Yet, the research in that article pointed out that those who are regular Bible students, like y'all are, that certain things happen in their lives. Um, There's a a decrease in the feeling of loneliness. There's a decrease in the feelings of anger. There's an increase in your desire to share your faith with other people. There's an increase in your desire to disciple and and help others grow in the faith. All attributable to positive, regular interactions with the Scriptures. So that is why we are committed to teaching through the Bible verse by verse And what we can't do on weekends, we do on Wednesdays. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. It used to be in the old days, we had a Sunday morning service, a Sunday night service, and a Thursday night service. So Sunday morning, I would do a smaller portion, a homiletical approach to it. Sunday night, I would go through several chapters of the Bible, a different study altogether. 
Thursday night, a completely different study where I would go in depth, like Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. The next week, Galatians chapter 1, verse 2, really in depth like that. But uh, at this point, because we have our Saturday night, we have our weekend services that comprise one message, but we still go through the Bible. Now, interest in Bible study like this does wane and is waning, and fewer churches are having midweek services. So I just thank God that there are some people who can still tolerate sound doctrine. Because the Bible says in the last days will come people who do not tolerate sound doctrine. I'm glad that you're the exception and not the rule. So we're in the book of 1 Kings. We're in chapter 1. And you'll notice it's called the first book of Kings. It's about kings and the kingdom of Israel. When our nation, the United States of America, started, we were actually part of a kingdom. There were 13 British colonies, and we were part of the monarchy in England under the king. But those 13 colonies felt that they were not being represented in England, though they were being taxed by England, uh, quite regularly, you know, governments love to figure out ways to tax its citizens and constituents and come up with all sorts of new taxes. And yet, um, people in the 13 colonies felt that they were not being adequately represented. And so uh, they came up with the slogan, taxation without representation. And they fought against that. And they decided that we want to be our own country and not pay allegiance to a king. We want to be a country of the people, by the people, for the people. Self-rule, self-governance. And we'll elect our leaders, not have a monarch over us. So here we are. A couple hundred years later uh, or so, uh, we exist um, so far uh, as a sovereign nation. What's interesting is after all these years of saying no to England, how fascinated most Americans are with the monarchy in England. The pageantry of the queen and the king and uh, coronation is coming up. And, and uh, again, I was reading a different article about how when the crown, anybody see the crown, that series called The Crown on Netflix? Um, uh, it even features when Billy Graham came over and spoke to the queen. But the people in England were astonished at how many Americans were still interested in all things British uh, and, and how they had so many loyal followers to the crown. Well, the book of Kings is about 40 different crowns. First and second Kings covers about 400 years and it looks at the reign of of king after king after king. King Saul was the first king of Israel, King David the second, and now we're about to see the third, King Solomon. Let me remind you how it all began with Israel. Israel had been governed by God. It was a theocratic kingdom. God spoke his law through Moses to the people. But as time went on, the tribes began to fragment, get restless, and they came to God's representative, Samuel, and they said, make us a king that we can be like the other nations. Now, I feel that was a mistake because Israel's strength lay in the fact that it was unlike all the other nations nations. It was singular. It was a theocracy. God gave a law. His law was to rule and reign. God would speak through the priesthood, through the prophets. The people wanted a political leader. And I feel that uh, the more politicians you get involved in any society, the more problems you have. It's just, I see it as a general axiomatic rule of life that um, when a nation goes awry they 
They, the, the government grows bigger and bigger. Well, they wanted a big government, and Samuel said, you listen, I'll tell you, you say you want a king, but the king is going to tax you. The king is going to use your uh, sons and daughters as slaves, servants for his household, his agenda. They said, I don't care, make us a king. So they found a king. His name was Saul. You know Saul's story. We covered Saul's story. After Saul, David, a man after God's own heart, was on the throne, and it was something that God chose, and that began the dynasty of King David through his son Solomon. We will see, though, that the united kingdom becomes a divided kingdom. The kingdom was united under King Saul and King David and King Solomon. 120 years, it was a united kingdom, a united monarchy. Forty years each, those kings reigned. But after that, the kingdom split, and you will see the kingdom split. Chapter 12, the kingdom divides north and south. They will never be the same again. The problems that begin with Solomon grow in the south and in the north. Eventually, the only solution God can see for a disobedient, divided people is to send them into captivity for 70 years. And so the story will end when the Babylonian Empire is on the rise and they get taken captive. So if I am going to divide or give you an outline of this book of 1 Kings, I'm going to divide it into two sections. Chapters 1 through 11, chapters 12 through 25. First section, chapters 1 through 11, the United Kingdom, or the United Monarchy. Chapters 12 through 25, the Divided Kingdom, or the Divided Monarchy. In the first section, chapters 1 through 11, the Reign of Solomon. The second section, 11 through 25, the Reign of Several. Several different kings after Solomon, after the kingdom divides. A spoiler alert is in order. The reason the kingdom split is Solomon's fault. When the kingdom splits, you'll see that. You'll see that oh, the, northern, the guy who takes the northern tribe says, look, your father was heavy in his taxation. And his son, Solomon's son, will speak up and say, you think he was bad? What do you see I, what I do to you? And so that, you know, the, the kingdom split. But it divided because Solomon was divided. How was Solomon divided? Solomon was divided, first of all, in his marriage. Jizz. His marriages. He married several women. Hundreds, thousands of women were in his life. The king of Israel, according to the law of Moses, was to have a wife. For that matter, everyone's supposed to have one wife. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, not to his wives, but to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The king of Israel was to abide by that. But Solomon brought in different women, and because he had a divided marriage, he had a divided heart. They helped divide his heart, his loyalties, not toward the Lord, but toward other gods, other worship system. He became open to other viewpoints, and the kingdom split. So a divided marriage brought a divided heart, brought a divided kingdom, as we will see in chapter 12. And the real overall lesson as we get into this chapter, the overall lesson of the book, and it's a lengthy chapter, and you're thinking, Skip, you better hurry up because it's a long chapter. Largely, we're just going to read through this chapter. And again, you know what? Wherever we stop, we pick up next week and continue anyway. So it doesn't matter. But the overarching lesson of the book of 1 Kings is that any society that pushes God out of national life is doomed. That's the overarching lesson. That's why this book is so germane and so applicable and so up to date for this generation right now. Any nation 
that once swore an allegiance in God we trust and pushes God away, pushes God out, is guaranteed looking at their own demise and doom. I get worried when I look at our country through the lens of Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said they didn't want to retain God in their thinking. And so God gave them over to uncleanness. A couple verses later, God gave them over to vile passions. A couple verses later, God gave them over to a debased mind, a reprobate mind, to do those things that are unnatural, unseemly. Now, you look at what's going on, the, the national languages, uh, language and, and, and talking points of our country. It's Romans chapter 1. We've pushed God away. We've said we don't want to keep God in our thinking, and we should be able to identify as whatever gender we are and marry anybody we want to and say we're whoever we say we are. God says, really, if you want that, I'll give you over to it. And that's the first sign that a nation is under judgment when God consigns them to, gives them what they say they want. You know, the restraining power of God is one of the best graces he's ever done. When he removes that and gives people what they say they passionately want and their thinking is confused, it, it's, it's a sign that they're looking at doomsday. With that pleasant introduction, we begin in verse 1. Now, King David was old. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. He was 70 years old when he died. So, can I just say from my perspective, he's not that old. <laughs> so it says, King David was old. And it says advanced in years. Now, that's a very nice way of putting the old King James says stricken in years. Stricken in years. And it, you can be old, but not stricken in years. You can be young and stricken in years. He wasn't that old. Moses, when he was in his 90s, it says his natural vigor was not abated. His eyesight was uh, sharp, and his mind was sharp, and his physical vigor was sharp and strong. David... Approaching 70 years of age, it says he is old and advanced in years. Now, David did lead a hard life. He was a warrior. Uh, and when you are engaged in the kind of activities David was engaged in, and you live your life for 10 years on the run as a fugitive, camping in tents, and the intrigues of David's life, it, it wore on him. So he's old, you know, 70, advanced in years. And they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord the king, and let her stand before, that is, stand to minister like a nurse would, stand before the king, and let her care for him, and let her lie in your bosom, that our Lord the king may be warm." I need to explain that <laughs> because, first of all, it sounds really goofy to a modern audience to read that, understandably. I mean, who does that? Um, kings do that, right? When, when you're the king of any country, you have a harem, you can do whatever you want. But that's not really the case here with David. Um, first of all, when we age our metabolic rate decreases. And the elasticity in our blood vessels decreases, so uh, we don't have the circulation that we once had. Uh, add to that the uh, fatty tissue beneath the skin is diminished. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, become a large person when you age, but the fatty tissue that keeps you warm uh, under epidermal layers, under the skin, diminishes, so... All of that combined, as we age, we feel cold. That's why, if you wonder, why is grandma always so cold? To come into her house, it's like 85 degrees. That's why. 
Now, in those days, they didn't have central heat. They didn't have electric blankets. They had human beings who are 98.6 degrees, right? That's body temperature. So that's a source of heat. And according to Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, and according to a Greek physician named Galen, wrote between 150 to 300 AD, this was a common practice in antiquity, a common practice when, when you have Uncle George and Aunt Harriet and Grandma and Grandpa and they're old, uh, old and they need to get warm, is that a human body uh, would get close to them to, to supply heat. It was a common therapeutic practice uh, in ancient times. You and I read this and go, that's just weird. Uh, but in those days, it was not weird. It was just considered to be practice. So the court doctors say, you know, find somebody to do that. And so um, that our Lord the King may be warm. Just a, a thought came to my mind. Do you remember that verse in Ecclesiastes where it says two are better than one? And it says, again, if two lie down together, they will be warm but how can one be warm when he is alone? So David is alone, and he is cold. He's old, and he's cold. And so the doctors say, get some body heat. So, verse 3, they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag, not an attractive name, but she was an attractive girl, and She's called the Shunammite and brought her to the king. And the young woman was very lovely and she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. The author wants the reader to understand that the king, King David, had no sexual relations with this young woman at all. That was not the intention. Uh, he's old, he's feeble, he's old and he's cold and... Abishag just provided body heat. This Shunammite girl. Okay, before we go on, let me just throw something out. It, it may be applicable, it may not be. But there is a theory that Shunammite is a synonym for Shulamite. And because of the region from where it comes from. Uh, Shunammite is, a, is, a, is somebody who lives in Shunem, and Shulam is, is the region. So it is believed by some that when Solomon writes the Song of Solomon and he praises the Shulamite woman, that that was Abishag, the one who provided this young, beautiful girl who provided heat for uh, King David, became eventually the bride, the wife, one of the wives. Uh, of Solomon. Just a theory, just thought you'd be interested in knowing, FYI. Uh, but again, it says, the king did not know her, no sexual relations whatsoever. Now, here's where the intrigue comes, and the purpose of the chapter is to let you know how Solomon became king, so here's the story. Now, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, Haggith was one of the wives of David. David had several wives. So Adonijah is one of the sons of David. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound like a rerun to you? This is Absalom 2.0. This is what another son of David did previously in the book right before this, Absalom. Absalom rebelled, said, I'm going to be the king. Basically, it was a coup to take the kingdom away from his dad. Now, Absalom's dead. Adonijah is the fourth son of David, probably the oldest, most legitimate heir to the throne. Now, let me just give you a quick little background of David. You know how many sons David had? He, there are 19 sons of David in the Bible that are named, 19 sons that are named, two sons that are not named, so 21 boys that we know of, one daughter that is named, 
So, you know, he has a bunch of kids. Uh, Amnon was killed by Absalom, his eldest. Amnon was murdered by another son of David, Absalom. Absalom, who tried to become king, was killed by Joab, the commander of David's army. The third son of David died young. The fourth son of David is Adonijah. Adonijah, without any prompting from his dad, any succession plan from his dad, just says, you know, dad's old and cold. I'm young and hot. I'm hot stuff, man. I'm going to be the king. And so he assumes, he presumes, and he exalts himself saying, I will be the king. He takes advantage of his father's weakened condition. He prepared for himself chariots, horsemen, and 50 men to run before him. And his father, this is very telling, and his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? David was a success at many things. I think he was an incredible warrior, an amazing singer, poet, writer in that regard. I mean, we thank God for the book of Psalms. Uh, I think he was an apt and wonderful king. He was a failure as a father. A failure as a father. He failed to discipline his children. This is not the first son. He did that with Absalom. He wouldn't talk to Absalom. And wouldn't give him the time of the day. And when Absalom came back, he, he shunned him for the longest time. And it, that kind of passivity in any man, in any father, will wreak havoc in that man's family. David was a passive father. Now, Solomon is going to be the king, and Solomon, also a son of David, is going to write the book of Proverbs. And Solomon had plenty of opportunity to learn from his father's mistakes and watch how dad treated Absalom and watch how dad treated um, Adonijah. And so David will write about it in Proverbs 29. A son left to himself, Solomon says, will bring shame to his parents. And he who withholds the rod, spanking, disciplining his child, he who withholds the rod hates his son. Whoever loves him will discipline him promptly. Solomon wrote that, and it was good writing. It was wisdom. It is God's word. It is truth. But David failed to do that with his kids. And here's another one. His father had not rebuked him at any time, saying, why have you done so? And then notice this. He, that is Adonijah, was also a very good-looking man. Why did the author put that in? Because whenever you have somebody who is a leader and is good-looking, that wins votes. That, that, puts, that puts the people in, that, in, in favor of that leader. It's just it's, it's been that way. Go back to the debates, the first publicly televised debates for the American presidency in our country between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. And learn how uh, uh, Nixon came into the debate kind of pale and kind of ashen looking. And Kennedy, you know, he had that um, Hyannis Port tan. And he was, you know, a man of the, the ocean. And he just looked like a movie star. And people said, oh, they swooned over him. He was good looking. And, and it put, that debate put people over the edge in voting for John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Whenever you have, though, somebody who is undisciplined and good looking, it's a lethal combination. This is a lethal combination. And it was for the kingdom. He was very good looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom. So Absalom, it says, was good looking. So it runs in the family. Evidently, Haggith and David were uh, a good looking couple. Then he, Adonijah, conferred with Joab. Do you remember Joab? Joab was the general for David, the commander of David's army. Joab had been loyal to David since the days when King Saul chased after David and 
David and his men had to run throughout the caves of Israel and different cities. Joab had been loyal to David since then. But Adonijah conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah. Zeruiah was David's half-sister. Son of Joida. Uh, oh, wrong verse. Uh, yeah, seven, thank you. Uh, he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, with Abiathar the priest, and they followed and helped Adonijah. Just filling in the blanks for you. Abiathar the priest was one of the priests in the city of Nob, N-O-B, when David fled to Nob for, because Saul was chasing him. And Saul sent his contingent of his army to that city. And a man named Doeg took out his sword and started butchering the priests who lived in Nob. Abiathar escaped and had been loyal to David ever since. He went with David. So you have two men that had been allies with David, loyal to David, now following in the conspiracy of Adonijah to take over the kingdom from David. That's why I say it's Absalom 2.0. But, verse 8, and this is important, Zadok the priest, Benaiah the son of Joiada, Nathan the prophet, Shemai, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. Benaiah, you don't remember him, but you will remember him when I describe him to you. Benaiah was one of the mighty men of David, a warrior of King David. He was, he was like in charge of the secret service. There were two groups of mercenaries um, uh, that you're about to meet in a few verses. The Cherethites and the Pelethites uh, hired guns to protect the king. Benaiah was over them. Also, Benaiah, it says in chapter 23 of 2 second, of second Samuel, that it was Benaiah who killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Remember that story? That was his claim to fame. He got it down into this hole, this pit. There was a lion. He jumped in and killed him. And, uh, it, he, you know, newspaper headlines the next day, you know, front page. He was famous from that event onward. So that is Benaiah. He is loyal still to David, as is Zadok the priest and uh, Shimei and uh, these other ones. Verse 9, And Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is by Enrogel. He also invited his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. So, Adonijah has a barbecue, a feast, a, a I'm king party, look at me, crown me king invitation to everybody except Solomon and the people loyal to David. They're left out. It tells us where it took place. Now, this is where I wish I had you right now in Jerusalem, because I would be able to point out where Adonijah did this. So in Jerusalem, when you go down to the city of David where, where Jerusalem first started, and you can, you can actually stand in the palace, what they believe to be the palace of King David. They've discovered it. You can look down into the valley, the Kidron Valley, and on the other side of the Kidron Valley is an Arab village called Siloam, and there's a rocky escarpment, kind of a, a sharp face, where two valleys meet, uh, the the Kidron Valley and the Hinnom Valley, where they meet, uh, there is uh, another spring called the spring or in Rogel. And on that rock that you can still see today is where this feast took place. So it wasn't far from David's palace. It wasn't far from the, the city of David. Just outside the city, outside the city wall, just across the valley. If we were there, you could, I could point it out to you uh, today. So he didn't go far. But, verse 10, he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the mighty men, or Solomon, his brother. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? 
What we learn from Scripture is that God revealed to David who the king after him would be. Would, would not be Absalom, would not be Amnon, would not be Adonijah. It would be Solomon. God revealed that to him. You say, well, where, where do you find that at? So in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, I'm reading it to you. You can just write it in the margin of your Bible so you know. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 9, God said to David, Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest, man of peace. I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, for I will give him peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son. I will be his father. I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. God told that to David. We find out David told that to Bathsheba, but not to anybody else. Again, that was a mistake. He should have announced his succession plan well in advance, should have told Nathan the prophet, should have told the mighty man, this is what's going to happen, this is what the Lord said. Evidently, he didn't want to let the cat out of the bag because he knew that the oldest son in line for the throne, Adonijah, could start a rebellion, so he probably kept it to himself out of fear. Well, guess what? Uh, he didn't even tell anybody that Solomon would be the king, and there was still a rebellion by Adonijah. And so... He comes to David, or comes to Bathsheba, Nathan the prophet, and says, Hey, did you hear what's going on? Come, please, verse 12. Let me give you counsel how that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. He knew what that meant. If Adonijah becomes king, all those who vie for the throne or think they should be in line for the throne, they're usually executed, exterminated. That's how it worked. Go immediately, Nathan said to Bathsheba, go immediately to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? Then, while you're still talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Now, why are they staging this? Because by the mouth of two or more witnesses, every word will be established. And so you go and bring that witness to your husband. I'll come in after you as the prophet and attest to it. So Bathsheba went to the chamber to the king. Now, the king was very old. Again, they keep saying that of this not too old guy. And Abishag the Shunammite was serving the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did homage to the king. Then the king said, What is your wish? She said to him, My lord, you swore, and I love this, My lord, little L, you swore by the Lord, capital L, your God, to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Now look, Adonijah has become king, and now, my lord, the king, you do not know about it. I didn't tell you the name Adonijah is a beautiful name. Adonijah means Adonai is the Lord. Yah, Adonai is Yahweh, is God. You can have a good name, but not have a good life. Jesus in the book of Revelation said to a church, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. So you can have the right name, the right reputation attached to that name, but your life doesn't bear witness to the name that you have. And so we take, we take that to heart because we are named Christian, Christ-like, little Christ, those who... Um, reflect his glory. So, 
Verse 18, now look, Adonijah has become king and my lord the king doesn't know about it. He has sacrificed oxen, fatted cattle, and sheep in abundance. He invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest, Joab the commander of the army, but Solomon your servant he has not invited. And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my Lord, the king, after him. In other words, step up to the plate, buckaroo. you got to make a move now. Inactivity will not work at this point. Passivity will not be the call of the day. You need to decide and make it public your transition plan. Otherwise, it will happen when my Lord, the king, rests with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. And just then, while she was still talking with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And they told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. When he came in before the king, he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today and sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep in abundance. And he invited all the king's sons and the commanders of the army and Abiathar the priest. And look, they're eating and drinking before him. And they say, long live King Adonijah. But he has not invited me. Even me, your servant, nor Zadok, the priest, nor Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, nor your servant Solomon. Has this thing been done by my lord, the king? And Have you not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him? Then King David answered and said, now David is old, frail, stricken in years. But you'll notice something. He's still mentally sharp. He knows the play he has to make. He knows the staging of the play he has to make. David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence, stood before the king. And the king took an oath and said, and I love this verse, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress... Boy, David had been in so many different distresses, hadn't he? And notice the wording of this. He didn't say that the Lord kept me from experiencing every distress. That's the theology of some false teachers to this day, that if you're a child of God, he'll keep you from distress. He didn't keep David from it. He has not kept me from it. I go through as many distresses as anybody. But the Lord delivered me from all of them. Here I am, still taking a licking and keep on ticking. David, too, he had been through so many trials. But he is testifying. This is his testimony. The Lord has redeemed my life from every distress. I faced them. I went through them. But here I am just even though he's old and cold. Just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will go and sit on my throne in my place, so I certainly will do this day. So he's recalling that promise that I just read to you. God told me this, so we're going to get her done today. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did homage to the king, and she said, Let my Lord King David live forever. Well, he's going to be dead in the next chapter, so he's not going to live forever. And and it would be cruel to have somebody who's old and stricken in years live forever. Uh, There comes a time where you just got to check out and move on. Um, This was a pleasantry. This was a greeting. This was common. You would commonly say that to any king or queen. May the king live forever. Even though you know they're not, you just, it's their hopes that their God would perpetuate and bless their reign. But it's interesting. I read through that this morning. Let my Lord King David live forever. And I thought, you know, in actuality, 
he will live forever. I expect to see David in heaven. He is going to have eternal life. Uh, he is going to be in glory as a believer, an Old Testament believer. In fact, I'm just going to throw this in at you. Many people who are in touch uh, with eschatology and studying eschatology go so far as to say in the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, where Jesus rules and reigns, that David will be his co-regent, reigning for a thousand years with Jesus. And why not? He's going to be resurrected, and we're all going to be there. So um, why would they say that? Because there are two passages in the Old Testament. One is in Ezekiel chapter 36. We failed to read it a couple weeks ago when we dealt with that on Sunday morning. But it talks about God will raise up his anointed, it's the Messiah, who will rule and reign over the earth, over Israel in that glorious millennial kingdom. And it says, and David will serve as the prince. So some interpret that as, well, that just means the son of David, Jesus, will, will, will rule and reign. Perhaps. Or it could be that King David will actually be resurrected to, in the millennial kingdom, co-reign. How exciting would that be? See Jesus in Jerusalem reigning over the entire earth, and then, you know, David up there going, this is fun, you know. I, I don't have to call the shots anymore, but I can serve with the one that I prophesied about. So anyway, when he says, Lord, let my Lord King David live forever, well, he will. King David said, call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Joida, and they came before the king. So the highest ranking uh, prophet, military leader, etc., King said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord, have Solomon my son, watch this, ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There let Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, anoint him over Israel, blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. Then you will come after him. He shall come and sit on my throne. He shall be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. And Benaiah, the son of Joida, answered the king and said, Amen. May the Lord God of my Lord, the king, say so too. Like, I just like what you just said, David, and I, I pray that God says what you said. That's what all that's about. And the Lord, as the Lord has been with my Lord, the king, so may he be with Solomon, Make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. In ancient times in Israel, during times of peace, kings did not ride horses. They rode on donkeys. And so the king had his own special donkey, his own special mule, uh, it was forbidden for anybody except the next king or the king himself to ride on that mule. So put him on my mule, take him down to the Gihon Spring. The Gihon is the source of water. I can show you the Gihon Spring today. It still flows out of the ground. And it was at the base of the city of David, the base of the wall. Incidentally, later on, one of the kings of Judah named Hezekiah saw that the Gihon was a problem because if an enemy wanted to attack Israel, they would stop up the Gihon spring, the water source that feeds Jerusalem because it's right there at the base of the wall, just outside the wall. So an enemy could come in, stop the flow of it, and the city would not have water. So King Hezekiah ordered that a tunnel be dug underground through solid bedrock. 1,750 feet, and he had his two groups of men, one starting at this end where the Gihon is, one starting at where it was going to end, and they dug together. Now, what are the odds of them getting at the right level this way and this way? And they met in the middle, and where they met in the middle, they engraved into the rock, basically in Hebrew, this is where the two groups met when we dug Hezekiah's tunnel. You can still see that inscription to this day. It's exciting. 
So Hezekiah brought this uh, water source from the Gihon into the city and had it collect at a pool you've heard of, the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam was created so water from the Gihon would be accessible to the Jerusalemites. That is very prominent in the New Testament. Jesus healed a man at the Pool of Siloam. You can see the archaeological digs of the Pool of Siloam. When you come with us to Israel, we'd love to point it out. So, um, take Solomon, my son, down to the Gihon. Okay, I mentioned kings ride at a time of peace on a donkey. Fast forward to another son of David named Jesus Christ, who will also come into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and he will say to his disciples, get me a donkey, and he rides into Jerusalem presenting himself as their king in the Gospels, fulfilling what Zechariah said in chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Uh, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, your king comes to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, the foal of a donkey, fulfilling that prophecy. So the son of David, the first, the successor of David, does it as Jesus did but was rejected years later. So Zadok, verse 38, the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Joida. Here they are, here they are. The Cherethites and the Pelethites. That's the mercenary army that Benaiah is over. Went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and took him down to the Gihon. Then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and they blew the horn, and the people said, Long live King Solomon. The anointing of oil symbolized the empowerment, the endowment, the capability bestowed by God upon that person. Priests were anointed, kings were anointed, and so the word... Messiah, the word Messiah, Mashiach, is a Hebrew word that we translate Messiah, is a word from the root word to smear. It means the anointed one or the smeared one, the one who has been uh, smeared with oil or had oil poured over, selected and ordained, anointed, empowered by God. That's where the term Messiah originates. So take him down to the Gihon, take oil, pour it on him and say, Long live King Solomon. All the people went up after him. The people played the flutes, rejoiced with great joy. I love this part. So that the earth seemed to split with their sound. So Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they <laughs> finished eating. Sudden indigestion took over. And when Joab heard the sound of the horn, see, he's a military guy. You hear a horn, you think, uh-oh, there's a battle going on. He heard the sound of the horn. He said, why is the city in such a noisy uproar? While he was still speaking, there came Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest. And Adonijah said to him, come in, for you're a prominent man, and bring good tidings. And Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, well, not so much. No, our Lord King David has made Solomon the king. The king has sent with him. Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites, the Pelethites, the whole gang. They made him ride on the king's mule. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, they've anointed him at the Gihon. They've gone up from there rejoicing so that the city is in an uproar. This is the noise that you've heard. Also Solomon sits on the throne of his kingdom. In other words... Solomon, ceremony's over. He is now the co-regent. He is reigning with his father until his father dies. Moreover, the king's servants have gone to bless our Lord King David, saying, may God make the name of Solomon uh, better than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. Also the king said thus, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has given one to sit on my throne this day, while my eyes see it. So this is Jonathan just sort of like giving the blow by blow play. This is what they said. This is what's going on. This is what everybody's doing. And so he's telling this to the dinner party who's having the barbecue with 
the fake king. So get this. Look at verse 49. So, so then all the guests who were with Adonijah were afraid. It's like, oops, wrong party. And they arose, and each one went his way, and Adonijah was afraid of Solomon, so he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Horns of the altar, the altar of sacrifice in the tabernacle. Temple wasn't built yet. Horns are the protrusions on the corners. The belief is that if you hold it, um, there's a scripture, actually. You don't have time to look it up, but in, in um, uh, just write this down or remember Exodus chapter 21 talks about grabbing the horns of the altar. If you committed a crime, uh, you would go do that. Uh, that's why cities of refuge were built, so that your case could be heard in a court of law. And so the idea is that the altar of sacrifice is where God atoned for my sin. He was merciful to me at that altar. If I grab the horn of the altar, may all those around me be merciful to me as God is merciful in atoning for my sin here on this altar. That's the idea. Uh, and um, that's all well and good unless uh, it was a capital offense, then you drag him off uh, from the altar and kill him. So, not a good ending. So Adonijah was afraid of Solomon to uh, uh, grab the horns of the altar. And it, it was told Solomon, saying, Indeed, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon, for look, he's taken a hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Then Solomon said, If he proves himself a worthy man, not one hair of his head will fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. Whoa. So King Solomon sent them to bring him down from the altar, and he came and he fell down before King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, Go to your room. Go to your house. Go home. This is where we end. It's a long chapter. We finish chapter one. This begins the dynasty of King David that will take us all the way to Jesus Christ. The genealogy will take us all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise is that the throne of David will be established forever. And it will be done so by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where it begins. Here's something to keep in mind. Solomon was not the oldest. Technically, Adonijah, as the oldest, would be in line for the throne. Um, and Bathsheba was the gal that he had an affair with who was married to another guy, and Solomon was the second son of that relationship. You would think God would sort of bypass Solomon and get the oldest son, which would be Adonijah. However, we have often seen, have we not, that God rejects the oldest for the youngest. That it wasn't Ishmael, it was Isaac. It wasn't Esau, it was Jacob. It wasn't Reuben, it was Joseph. Right? He, he often does that. And uh, he does that, A, because he's sovereign, B, because he's merciful. So here is a relationship born in sin, David and Bathsheba, one of the offspring of that relationship, they were married at the time, was Solomon. He becomes the king. And uh, the kingdom goes on through him that will take us to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what it shows us is, again, the grace of God woven through the tapestry of Scripture. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is sovereign. God picks who he wants. Um, and... God has chosen the foolish things of the world. I'm drawing a circle around all of us. The weak things of the world to confound the wise and the mighty. And so here we are. We're perfect for God to use because we're all of those things. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your choice. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who fulfilled all of the promises and will fulfill all of the promises that you spoke to David when he comes to rule and reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem 
we ruling and reigning with him before the new heaven and the new earth. We look forward, Lord, to that day, and we thank you that when all of that comes down, we who are students of your word will uh, know what to expect. And Father, it, it just breeds in us a greater excitement and anticipation. Thank you, Father, for these who defy the odds, the 82% of Christians that never read through the Bible, they don't know it. This group knows it. Thank you, Father, for their hunger, their thirst. You said in your word that you reward those who diligently seek you. I pray that you would openly reward these servants of yours throughout this week in their families, in their business, with their health, in their projects, in the things they're praying about. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? And as you stand to your feet, let me just make that a, a benediction. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you his peace and his rest. And may all that you commit to him be brought to fruition in Jesus' name. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.